This episode is brought to you by Mac Weldon. What is up, Solo Cups? My name is John Solo, and you're watching Messed Up Origins, the show where I dive deep into folklore history and break down the shockingly dark original versions of your favorite myths and fairy tales. Today, we're talking about a little story called The Emperor's New Clothes. It was written by the legendary Hans Christian Andersen, and to my complete and utter disappointment, has absolutely no connections to The Emperor's New Groove. It could. Nuh uh. Yeah, ha. Uh -uh. Yeah, ha. Okay, but it really doesn't, nor to Kronk's new groove, nor to the Emperor's new school. That being said, it's a fantastic story with a timeless moral that is applicable to many aspects of our society today, and I believe will resonate with every single person watching this. However, before we break down this story about an emperor getting some new clothes, I want to tell you about some sick fits I recently picked up from today's sponsor, Mac Weldon. So we're about to dive into a story where a wise and powerful emperor gets himself some new threads, and while looking into that story, I was motivated to do the same thing. Thing. But I didn't want to turn out like the Emperor and find myself fooled by some smooth-talking salesman. I wanted some high-quality, durable fits that I was going to look good in. That's when I found Mack Weldon, a lifestyle brand that's reinventing men's basics from the ground up with premium fabrics and smart design. And while I may have pulled that quote directly from their website, I am not exaggerating when I say that these are my favorite clothes to wear now. For starters, everything I bought from Mack Weldon, from the sweatpants to the t-shirts to the Henleys, all fit exactly how I like. Tight enough to flex my physique, but still loose enough that I don't feel constricted. Then there's the premium quality that you can feel just by holding some of their products. They have a wide range of custom fabrics that can keep up with you no matter what you're doing that day. And on top of that, they're incredibly versatile. You can go to work, run some errands, go on a date and work out all in the same outfit and no one's gonna think that you're under or overdressed. Out of everything I bought though, my favorite has gotta be the silver crew neck t-shirt that I'm wearing in the rest of today's video. The material's strong enough that it holds its shape no matter how much I wear it, but is simultaneously incredibly incredibly lightweight, so I'm not sweating under the studio lights. Let me just put it this way. If you've ever wanted to wear something designed by Edna Mode, Mack Weldon is as close as it gets. And what's really cool is they have a completely free loyalty program called Weldon Blue that rewards you just for shopping with them. Level one gets you free shipping for life. And once you reach level two by spending $200, you get 20% off every order for the next year, plus a ton of other cool perks. If you want to give them a shot, just go to MacWeldon.com solo and use code solo at checkout to get 20% off your first order. Also prepare yourself because if you're anything like me, once that first order comes in, you're going to want to put in a second one. And with that out of the way, it's time for us to jump into it. As always, make sure you hit that like button if you want to support the show. And of course, subscribe and ring that bell to be notified whenever I upload. I mean, you might get the notification five days late like I do with some of the creators I follow. Nice job, YouTube. But remember, if you don't see me post anything for a week, just check the channel on Fridays and chances are you're going to find something new here. Sucks that we're at this point where one of the two most important features of YouTube barely works, but here we are. <sighs> anyway, on to the story. So Anderson opens the Emperor's new clothes by introducing us to the Emperor himself. He doesn't have a name, nor does his kingdom, but as tempting as it is to call him Cusco, I'm going to fight the urge to avoid confusion. Instead, we're going to call him Tony, and his kingdom... Tony Topia. Now I'm sad to say that Tony is not a very good leader. He pays no mind to strengthening his military or his relationship with his citizens. Literally all this dude cares about is wearing the most elegant and expensive attire possible and the only reason he'd ever make public appearances was to show it off. Then one day, two swindlers who knew about the Emperor's unhealthy obsession came into town with the intention of taking advantage. They approach his majesty and claim that they could weave a cloth so fine that it'd be invisible to anyone who was unfit for their job or hopelessly stupid. Plot twist though, the oh-so-talented weavers are trying to pull one over on your boy who just gobbles up every bit of their BS. Without asking for references or even a single example of something they'd woven before, he just gives them a big stack of money along with the most delicate silk and finest gold thread the kingdom has to offer so they can get to work right away. Little does he know, they're not even using the materials he's giving them. Instead, they just shove it all into their bags before going back to work on nothing at all. A few days go by and Emperor Tony is getting curious about how much progress the weavers have made, but he's a little too nervous to check on them himself. After all, if he goes to visit them and it turns out he can't see the cloth, it either means he's unfit to rule or hopelessly stupid. The funny thing is we, the audience, already know both to be true. Instead of going himself, Tony sends his trusted prime minister because he's always shown himself to be an intelligent man who's good at his job. But lo and behold, when the PM goes to the weaver's workshop, he sees them working tirelessly at the loom and starts to tweak because he can't see the fabric. Obviously, he can't tell Tony 
Mahoney about this because it means he's unfit for office, right? So get this, he lies and says it's chef's kiss. Meanwhile, the weavers who see that no one is catching on to their literal charade keep on asking for the finest of silks, even more golden thread, and of course, more payment. Then a few days later, Tony sends another servant over to check on him, and of course he can't see the cloth either, but he also lies about it and says it's exquisite. So at this point, the pressure is really on Tony to just grow some cojones and check out the weaver's work himself. His servants are all talking about how gorgeous it is, rumors about its magical properties have spread throughout the kingdom, he can't put it off any longer. The problem is he's still feeling insecure about whether or not he's a big fat idiot, so he invites his entourage to check out the loom along with him. During their visit, the swindlers did a very convincing job of fake weaving, and Tony's entourage did an even better job pretending they could see what was being weaved. So guess what? Even though Tony didn't see a single thread of fabric on that loom, he pretended it was the most stunning piece of cloth he had ever laid eyes on. Then, one of his very helpful servants suggested that Tony wear these fresh fly threads while marching in the grand parade that was scheduled in just a few days. And because your boy couldn't be called out on his bluff, he agreed. So when the day finally comes and it's time for your highness to get dressed, the weavers put on this big show of delicately cutting the fabric and delicately sewing pieces together. Then they slowly raised up his trousers and slowly pulled the shirt over his head. But even after he put on the coat and all, the emperor didn't feel like he was wearing anything. He felt totally naked, but the weaver said that was because the fabric was as light as spider webs. Man, people got away with so much more before you could just Google shit. Is there really fabric that's lighter than spider webs? Interesting. Cut off their heads. Sadly, the emperor couldn't Google anything. He couldn't even ask Jeeves for some insight. So he had the servants attach a train to his jacket and marched right out the palace gates in front of a crowd of his cheering citizens. And what's really funny about this is no one reacted to him being naked. Since they all knew that not being able to see his outfit meant they were stupid, they all pretended to fawn over the masterful handiwork of the artisans, saying things like, those are the sickest fits he's ever worn and check out the drip on this guy. But in the midst of all their cheering, a tiny child's voice cries out, but the emperor isn't wearing anything. And in that instant, the illusion is shattered. There's something about the innocence of the child and his lack of something to lose that tears down the public self-imposed blinders and they realize, wait, it's not just me. The emperor really isn't wearing any clothes. Of course, the emperor realized that at the exact same time everyone else did, but he couldn't let himself be psyched out. He stood up even straighter than before, vertically, not horizontally, and finished the parade with his head held high. This one, I mean. As for the swindlers, they skipped town during the parade and were never heard from again. And that is what I love about fairy tales. Sometimes the bad guys get to win. So, now you know the story of the Emperor's new clothes in its entirety. I know you've been waiting a long time for this day to come, and I'm beyond excited to be part of the special occasion. But there's more to this story than just the story. Just like the other Anderson fairy tales we've talked about in the past, there's some analysis to be done and a fascinating history to uncover. For example, you might be surprised to hear this, but the plot of the Emperor's new clothes is not an Anderson original. He was actually inspired by a Spanish story written back in 1337, almost exactly 500 years prior to his own publication called What Happened to a King with the Rogues Who Wove the Cloth. People used to really blow at coming up with titles, huh? This story was included in a collection called Tales of Count Lucanor by a guy named Don Juan Manuel. It contained 51 cautionary tales and was released in 1337. And just like the other collections we've looked at over the years, whether it be 1001 Arabian Nights or Sinbad or the Pentamerone, it contains an overarching frame story through which the other tales are being told. Prior to starting each tale, a character called Count Lucanor asks a servant Petronio a question and gives him a problem to solve. Solve. Petronio then tells a story with a similar problem, and from its conclusion, he figures out the solution. Now, when it comes to what happened to a king with the rogues who wove the cloth, for the most part, the plot is pretty similar with the disparity stemming from the differences in cultures and the time period it was written in. In the Spanish version, three weavers, not two, somehow convince the royal court that only legitimate sons can see the cloth they weave. And unlike the swindlers in Anderson's story, the deception that these Spanish weavers are engaging in could have truly disastrous consequences. The king isn't just 
just nervous that he'll look stupid or people will think he's unfit for office because Spanish courts only allowed legitimate sons to inherit thrones and land. That means if the king is proven to be an illegitimate son, he would lose his throne and either be executed for his lies or exiled from his kingdom. So throughout the entire story, the main character is terrified about people finding out he can't see the cloth, but what he doesn't realize is that nobody else can either. It isn't until the end of the tale when a poor stable boy who isn't at risk of losing an inheritance exposes the lies in front of the court by pointing out he isn't wearing anything at all. And when it comes to the moral that Petronio takes out of the tale, it's a reminder to the rich and powerful that their social inferiors are watching and not as powerless as they might seem. Now, Anderson didn't actually read this version of the story, rather a German translation of it, but if you know anything about his personal life, you know that's a moral that would resonate with him. And for those who aren't familiar with his personal life, I'll tell you exactly why that is. While Hans Christian Andersen may have grown up to be a world-famous author whose stories influenced the minds of adults and kids alike, he did not have a good childhood. He was financially destitute, he lost his father who inspired his love of reading around the age of 12, and was bullied by other kids for his awkward appearance and atypical interests in the arts. Then, when he was finally lucky enough to attend specialty schools based on his interests, both the students and faculty gave him shit for growing up poor and not belonging in their social circles. Anderson grew up with feelings of loneliness and insecurity that followed him throughout his adult life, and things didn't even get better after he finally answered what he felt was his calling and began to write children's stories. As we've talked about many times on this channel before, the first two installments of his first collection, Fairy Tales Told for Children, were torn apart by critics who chastised him for not following the typical fairy tale format. Because God forbid you try something new, right? In fact, the criticism shook Anderson so much that he almost quit writing children's stories entirely. Those first two installments were published within six months of each other, and he held on to the third one for over a year before letting it go to print, a decision we'll talk more about in just a minute. The reason this is all relevant is it led to Anderson both resenting and envying the authority figures around him. Whether it was teachers or critics, the people who were supposedly most qualified in the subjects he was passionate about told him he didn't have what it takes. And while he was in no position to directly question their authority, he could do so through his writing. For example, Princess and the Pea was written as a parody of the oversensitivity of the aristocracy and their inability to tolerate things they didn't like or that made them uncomfortable. As for the Emperor's new clothes, though, that was to shine some light on the consequences of collective hypocrisy and the royal family's vanity. See, in addition to his bad experiences with the upper social strata, Anderson was born just after the French Revolution, which in part was caused by the reckless spending of King Louis XVI. Despite heavily taxing its citizens, the kingdom was on the brink of bankruptcy, and those in power refused to do anything about it. So, the people they ruled over did something about it. However, despite new rulers being put in place and new legislation being introduced, even in Anderson's home country of Denmark, which was largely unaffected by the French Revolution, the same problems seemed to continue, with the ruling class neglecting their responsibilities in favor of focusing on their vanity. He just couldn't wrap his head around how all these same problems could continue in spite of all the death and destruction that occurred over the decade before he was born, and the fact that no one was talking about it. As a result of all this, his personal experience with the privileged and being bullied for how he looked, combined with his knowledge of the turmoil that nearby kingdoms had just gone through, he considered vanity to be the cardinal sin of human nature. So, he made an example out of Emperor Tony by making his vanity the direct cause of his embarrassing himself in front of all of his subjects, just like the real royal families had done. Some folklorists even go so far as to say the kid who points out that the emperor is naked is supposed to be Anderson himself, and there's good reason to believe that. Because while he spent his early years living in poverty and being judged by the upper class, he started to affiliate with them more during that year-long hiatus he took where he had held off on releasing the third installment of his collection. During that break is when the people who really mattered, children and their parents, started to fall in love with his stories, and this made him quite the celebrity. Because of his new social status, he had finally become part of the upper class like he always dreamed of. Unfortunately though, it wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. Anderson just couldn't help but feel like he didn't belong with those people. The self-obsessed, materialistic, vapid bourgeois and the emperor's new clothes became his expose of their hypocrisy and snobbery. And what's especially crazy is that wasn't even the original ending. When Anderson sent what was supposed to be the final draft to the printers, it ended with the emperor marching naked in front of the crowd, and that's it. 
No one calling him out, no veil being lifted. But for reasons we can only theorize about, he was motivated to change the ending to the one we know today. Which is crazy when you really think about it, because if the Emperor didn't get called out and embarrassed in front of everybody, the story would be so much less impactful. But since he did, that kid's one line takes on so much meaning, and as a result has gone on to become an idiom that people use to this day when shaming people who choose to ignore what's in plain sight and blindly act as if there's nothing wrong. For example, folks who refuse to wear masks when going out in public. From my personal experience, they tend to act like if they just believe the virus isn't real, they're not gonna get it. But if that example's a little too sensitive for some of you, here's another. People who engage in call out and cancel culture every time a celebrity does something they don't approve of. Just like how the Emperor's servants wanted to prove they weren't stupid, there's people on Twitter wanting to prove how good they are by sending the most toxic messages they can to anyone who takes a social misstep. The only difference in that situation is that anyone who takes on the role of the child and calls out their shenanigans gets their head cut off, including me for this segment. I guarantee people are closing out this video and dropping dislikes because I dared to point out that the Emperor is not wearing clothes. That's okay though, a difference in opinion doesn't have to be a life or death thing. You know what does though? Hitting that like button, because if you don't, I will literally die. I mean, there's a few steps in between, but it could lead to me dying. And same goes for not subscribing, so make sure you do that too and turn notifications on. Also consider following me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, because like I said earlier, YouTube's notification notification system has been consistently running behind for the past several weeks. And while you're at it, you might as well follow Gunther too, because unlike the Emperor, he doesn't get embarrassed when he marches around naked in front of a crowd of people. Isn't that right, bud? You have no shame. As always, thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of Messed Up Origins. I'll see you all again next Friday with even more messed up content. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.